Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's lunchtime presentation. This week, we're covering growth and value strategies, and today we are hearing from International Biotechnology Trust. We're joined by Elsa Craig and Marek Koshepchinski, as well as Lucy Costa Duart, uh, who's responsible for investor relations. Elsa and Marek have worked together in IBT's management team since 2014, and this month brings their two year anniversary of being co managers in their own right. Um, IBT has traded at a premium to NAV at various points over the past five years and more latterly during the second half of 2021. Over 2022, in common with many other growth strategies, the shares slipped to a small discount, but it remains on the narrowest discount of the AIC peer group. I think Billy's frozen. Okay, let's just okay I think we'll just start because I think Billy lost his connection. But thank you, Billy, for inviting us to present um, the latest presentation for International Biotechnology Trust. Um, and thank you, everyone, who has taken the time to dial in. Uh, we're actually splitting the team geographically. Marek is in Boston at the Power and Healthcare Conference this week, which is why we have two um, screenshots of us. Um, uh, so the first slide is the usual disclaimer and then a reminder of the team who manages uh, International Biotechnology Trust. Marek and I, as Billy said, um, are celebrating our two-year anniversary as at the end of February of this year um, when we took over as co-lead fund managers of the, of the IBT. And we manage the public part of the trust, which is approximately 90% of the assets. And um, Kate Bingham manages the venture part of the portfolio, which makes up about 10% of the trust. Uh, you'll be familiar with our backgrounds, but we've been following biotech um, since the early noughties, both of us. Uh, Marek comes from industry and brings a certain expertise, which we can go into further into the presentation as well. So just um, we're pleased to receive various different awards in the time that we've been co-lead fund managers, ranging from best um, strategy all the way up to um, best communications. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so we're very thrilled with the, with those um, external recognitions. Uh, and the, moving on to the next slide, the, the presentation will be split into two halves. The first section discussing the backdrop of the biotech industry and the sector fundamentals, and the second section drilling down into into the trust itself. So Marek's going to kick off with um, why IBT. Over to you, Marek. Thank you, Elsa, and uh, thank you for having us here. So to begin with, I just want to say that the, the biotech sector is quite non-cyclical in, in the sense that we, we have long-term trends, demogra demographic uh, support and in the macro theme, in the, it's relatively recession-proof. When it comes to valuation, they have come down since the peak of the pandemic and, and post-pandemic highs. Uh, it's it, in the industry have a lot of mergers and acquisitions because large companies tend to buy smaller names. So it's a kind of a breeding ground for future acquisitions. And when it comes to IBT, around 10% of our trust is invested in venture, meaning companies that has not been listed yet or very relatively early. So if you move to the next slide, you can see the long-term trends here in the, in the world. So needless to say, Global population is growing, but the key here is that the population above the age of 65, or at least above the age of 50, is growing faster than the rest of the world. Meaning that uh, when you, you get older than 50, the ailments start to kick in, the heart failures, uh, the, the cancer comes in, and all other osteoarthritis, etc., Alzheimer's uh, to add to, to this uh, momentum of uh, diseases. Uh, so there's a high demand in the world for new uh, innovative drugs. Uh, as you can see, uh, the population of the age of 65 will triple over the coming 50 to 100 years, which is substantial. If you look at the next slide, you can also see that the industry uh, also have responded to the demand. And on the left-hand side, you can see the number of ongoing clinical trials, and we have seen rapid growth and a doubling of number of trials during the last decade. You can see a big uptick in during the pandemic, but that has moderated. But over time, it seems to be growing relatively steadily. And number of approvals on the right hand side has also steadily been growing over time. We had that some somewhat of a dip last year, 
mainly through the uh, backlog what what happened during COVID pandemic when clinical trials had to be stopped delayed or deferred to further in the future and also the fda the agency has not been able to visit particular sites so they have delayed approvals so we, but we believe over time this will correct itself and we will see continuous increase of approvals going forward if you take the next slide you can also see the the kind of resilience in the industry this this slide and graph show you the prescription of drug sales globally as you can see independent of recessions, uh, dips, COVID pandemics, you name it, we have a steady grow of pharmaceutical sales globally. So it's very recession proof, if you want to see it that way. Uh, and there's a sub-segment of, of the industry, uh, so-called rare diseases uh, and orphans, as we, we call it in the industry. That segment grows, it's a much faster pace than the rest of the industry and often addresses very high unmet needs often pediatric diseases. And this is an area we particularly like because we like drugs that address very high unmet need. We hardly need another diabetes drug that, that already just improves on, on the margin. Whereas you can actually in this particular area cure patients with, with an intervention. It's only maybe one drug available as well. If you take, take the next slide, uh, we, we are in the midst of, <clears throat> sorry, of a scientific revolution in, in, in this industry, in the biology, we've been helped by great computer powers, a very good understanding or much better understanding of the biology and science. So when, when I started to work in the industry around 20 years ago, we only had small molecules and monoclonal antibody, that was it. But if you see at this slide, on the left-hand side, we have seen a uh, couple of approvals of cell-based therapies. So basically what, what, what you do is take cells from a very sick patient, often hematological or always hematological malignancies, meaning blood cancers. You take the cell, cells from the patient, you clean the cell up, uh, you modify the cell, expand it externally outside the body. You, you modify the cells so they get very active and when you put it back into the patients, those cells actually work like missiles and kill the cancer cells in your body. And you might seem, it seems like a very science fiction, but it has very, very high cure rates in the 80% range for patients who are actually unable to go through the whole cycle. The current issue at the moment is that it, it's relatively cumbersome, very expensive. In the future, we might, might see allogenic cell cell therapies, meaning you can take them from the shelf rather than have your, your own cells being circula circulated in, in a cycle of three weeks. Gene therapies, we have recently seen an approval uh, for Unicure for hemophilia B. Uh, and it's a very interesting uh, theme because what you do in gene therapy, you add a gene that is missing uh, and start to express the protein that, that you miss. Hemophilia is a posted child because if you don't have that, you start to bleed. And we have seen several approvals of lately, and uh, we believe that this a continuous evolution of new ways of adding bigger, better genes and expression. The problem at the moment that has been the issue is that the durability of gene therapy expression. RNA therapies. Very quickly, you can say that the Moderna vaccine was based on RNA therapies. Is that precursor to proteins in between DNA expressed RNA and RNA expressed protein. And, and this is what, what happens. And we have seen a couple of drugs approved. Alnylam was on the mar has been on the market for several years, but Moderna put RNA on the map for, for anyone that understands the, how to develop drugs. And the latest one is gene editing. You just take snippets or a, a very small portion or a, only a part of a gene or even a base pair and just switch it and then you can cure patients by that. And by having said that, three of these methods, cell-based gene therapy and RNA therapies have drugs approved, gene editing not yet, but they have filed, CRISPR has filed uh, one of their treatments for sickle cell anemia. Uh, and we believe that that will, might be the first drug uh, approved based on this technology. A lot of promises going forward and the next decade we'll probably see a plethora of, uh, of drugs coming from these platforms. So if you take the next slide, 
uh, we always take the macro considerations when, in, when we, as portfolio managers, invest in, in biotech. Uh, what has happened of, of lately, as you can see on the right hand slide, that we have gone from 2% uh, government uh, bond yields to zero and now up to 5% of, of reason. And that often affects share price. And early stage companies, uh, which have a lot of cost up front and uh, revenues further down the line, will obviously be, be affected much harder than companies that have uh, cash generation uh, very near, nearby, like companies, large companies like Amgen, Gilead, Regeneron. And we have focused on cash flow generating companies because we believe inflation might be more persistent than, than might have been anticipated and interest rate will be held relatively high. Uh, and it, it needs to be so for a while to, to curb inflation. Uh, so unprofitable companies, we believe will struggle in the coming months at least, uh, but it's a good ground for acquisitions from larger companies. Uh, and I think uh, this is what we are going. We, we are in a position, a time when, when there was a lot of question marks in, in the market in general. And thus, if you put the next slide on, you see, you can see that our portfolio is constructed in such a way to balance both growth, high inflation, and potentially uh, if we have stagflation. So, we divide our portfolio in general terms as profitable companies, meaning companies that generate cash flow. There tends to be bigger companies like Amgen, Gilead, or Generon, as I told previously. And price earnings is a relatively good metrics for these companies. And when it comes to revenue growth, which we believe has kind of a big, it's perfect timing at the moment for, from our perspective, meaning that they, they are relatively early on in their cycle when it comes to approvals. They have either a drug approved, not yet selling, or a drug that has already started to sell, but not yet profitable. And in, in a high interest environment, growth will be hard to find, and revenue growth is an area where we, people will start to look for uh, upside. When it comes to early stage, we know that these companies are very, very dependent on, on the equity markets to raise money. And the only areas we, we have over time started to increase our positions the last year. But for us, the criteria are very, very hard when we invest in, in very relatively small companies. Uh, we have a couple of hundred companies out there and we we vet them very much before we invest. But the key is that they need to address a very clear unmet medical need uh, and focus on innovation. And uh, they need to have a really good management team with good investors behind them. So turning over to Elsa. Thank you, Marek. So what's happened in the broader markets um, since we took over as lead fund managers? Uh, we've put this slide in just to help describe the current market status. So when we arrived, um, valuations were pretty toppy in our view. Uh, and if you look at our website, we write a blog each month, which tries to pick up on thematic th um, themes where we see sort of a, an, an edge where we can comment on. And we did comment on how we felt that there were pockets of the biotech sector at the time that looked overvalued. And to give an example of that, one of the very early stage um, innovative companies called CRISPR was uh, had a market cap of over $12 billion. And for a company that hadn't even entered the clinic, so no testing on humans at that point, we felt it was a real red flag for us. Um, so at the time we went, as Marek just talked about, we tilted the fund into the sort of mid-stage companies. We did have exposure to early stage, but it was relatively low. And during the two years, what we've seen happen is the S&P 500 is the top turquoise line, um, that had a kind of drawdown at the beginning of 2022. Biotech, um, classic leading indicator, started its drawdown earlier than that at the end of 2021. What was driving that? That was probably valuations moderating and also uh, the fear of rising interest rates. So the autumn, the, the fear of that caused another correction, another drawdown in biotech. The two lines below the S&P 500 are representative of um, larger cap biotech for the NASDAQ biotech index, more weighted to large caps. 
and then there's a small more weight for small mid caps at the bottom. So small mid caps have had have been hit hard, and you'd expect that in a high interest rate environment. And it hasn't really recovered. And why is that? Well, we think that there's some really good companies in there. Um, but as and when they are posting positive results, for example, they then go out and raise money and, and have dilution. So we're not seeing the recovery in that part of the market just yet. So we're happy where we are um, with this overweight in the revenue growth names. So moving to this slide, this is another one of our blogs that you'll find on, on our website. What we've done here is um, because we've followed biotech for nearly well over two decades now, Marek and I, um, we've noticed that the sector tends to overshoot on the upside and overshoot on the downside. And we've seen this sort of cycle repeat itself over the past two decades. Um, so just starting round the clock, stage one, this is when there's been an overshoot to the downside. Um, we saw in May and June last year, many companies trading at below their cash positions in the bank, um, very out of favour, generalists not wanting to have exposure to the sector. Um, so that's what we call stage one. Stage two, M&A starts picking up. Um, biopharma are valuation sensitive. So they step in at this point to, to capture some of the exciting innovation that we see at the earlier stage names and valuations start to recover. Stage three, a more normalized market, um, steady influx of capital. Um, the IPO window will open and a steady normal normalized stream of M&A deals. Stage four, things are looking quite hot again. IPOs are getting earlier stage and stage five, all of those characteristics, but much, much stronger. So um, preclinical companies coming to market in the public um, and M&A stops. So where are we now? We think we're sort of in between stage two and three right now. We've seen a pickup in M&A. As Marek said, we've had 12 deals come out of the trust um, in, in the time that we've managed IBT in the last two years. So really nice um, kicker to, to NAV for us. Um, so we think we're sort of in between stage two and stage three. So this slide is key. Um, why are revenue growth names being picked up by big biopharma at the moment? Uh, we think it's, be it's because they need them. We haven't seen much M&A in the, in the recent years, probably due to the pandemic. And this is the problem that they've got. So the table on the top right shows the IP in sales expiry for the net the coming years in billions. So huge pressure on big biopharma to replace the voids that are coming up ahead of them. So how do they deal with that problem? They have to acquire companies and a drug, as you know, will take 10 years to develop at least. Um, so they're going for the more later stage assets and acquiring in sales. And you saw, I'll mention again later, but we've of the 12 deals that we've had so far, two of them were pretty significant to us in that we had large positions in the acquiry company, Biohaven picked up by Pfizer and Am Amgen um, currently being picked up by Amgen uh, at the end, sorry, Horizon being picked up by Amgen at the end of last year. Uh, and it's absolutely fits into what we've been talking about. They need to fill the future IP expiries with these um, de-risked revenue growth names. So this is the, the deals that we've had in the in IBT companies that have been acquired in this chart. What we've done is separated them out to the above the x-axis names that have come out of our public portfolio and then below the x-axis venture companies that have been acquired. Um, uh, and this goes back to March 2020, so three years, and we've had 12 um, in the last two years. And as I said, the big kickers really for us were Biohaven and Horizon, just because we had very large positions in those names at the time the deals were announced. So moving on to the portfolio. This is a snapshot of how our portfolio looks, and you can follow the changes month by month in our fact sheet on the website. Um, top right, just to re-emphasize, we have a, a large position in these revenue growth names. So these are companies that have been through the clinic successfully, gone through the regulator, had the drug approved, and they are now making sales, but not necessarily turned a profit. So they're high growth sales um, uh, and very attractive to big biopharma who need to, as I said, replenish their pipelines and their sales from IP expiry. Top left, we have a diversification across size. So all the way from very early stage venture companies 
um, to mega cap companies um, to the other end of the extreme. And these established mega cap companies are huge, some of them. So Amgen and Gilead, we have we can invest in those names if we want to, um, and we have the proportions you can see in that pie chart right now. So 11% in mega cap um, and mid cap 30%, and then the 10% uh, in, in the venture side. The next three slides, um, we've given some case studies on names uh, that we have decent positions in the portfolio. Intracellular is a central nervous system company. It's a revenue growth name. So they've launched their product called Cap Lighter. Um, and their product is something called a pipeline in a product. And what does that mean? That means the initial indication was for schizophrenia, and then they've gone and tested it in other indications to broaden the market size and potential for their drug. Um, they tested it in bipolar depression. Um, it was successful. And then that's since been approved in that um, indication as well, which is a, a significantly larger population to schizophrenia, which should boost growth over time. So we think this is the, it's just under 5 billion in market cap, a nice tuck in for big biopharma. Um, so this is one of our, our stronger positions. And then Unicure, another company that we've owned for a while. This company has just recently um, had their gene therapy for haemophilia B approved, um, literally very recently in recent months. They are partnered with a big pharma company called CSL on that program, and it's less than a billion in market cap. Horizon Therapeutics, we're going to redo this slide soon with another name that we like because this one's now in the process of being acquired by Amgen for $28 billion. Um, we still have a small position in the fund and Marek is over in the conference in Boston now to try and find some fresh new names to use the cash that we've gained from this to invest in some next generation uh, assets for the fund. We like this company, it was an orphan disease company. Um, had an amazing launch during COVID, uh, which is one of the best, if not the best, orphan disease launch ever. Um, and then Amgen recognised uh, the growth rate for this company and acquired them at the end of last year. So how do we approach our process um, with an IBT? Marek's history is that he used to work in business development in the biotech industry. Um, and their approach to looking at companies to acquire is very much what we're trying to emulate here in the trust. So what they would do is have consultants that are working on the ground in clinical development or at the regulator with biotech companies um, and give them certain projects uh, to understand whether the company that we're looking at um, ticks the boxes in terms of various different criteria. So we use these key opinion leaders, these KOLs, um, pick up the phone and ask them about what we're looking at, new ideas, and get their opinion. Um, and they really are at the cutting edge of what the industry is looking for. And so this source of idea generation and um, due diligence is very, very valuable to us. Volatility. Um, we have uh, lower volatility to, than our benchmark, the NASDAQ Biotech Index. And you can follow this again on our fact sheet. This is something we report each month. Um, volatility across the x-axis and return across the right, um, the y-axis, uh, and so that we're quite proud of that and we like that. I mean, we, we aim to continue to keep the volatility down. So, because this is an end of January presentation, we've got the end of January performance in here for compliance reasons. But as we've passed through February now, we've added another slide, which is the next slide which is a much more up-to-date one, and obviously our anniversary and end of interim. So we thought it'd be helpful to show the latest data. Um, so here we have one, three, five years of share price and NAV versus our benchmark, um, which we, we think looks solid. And then on the right-hand side, something to point out, we have discrete years in the bottom right of this table. Um, so February 21 to 22 was a down market, and the NAV outperformed our benchmark in a down market. And then the most recent year, February 22 to 23, was an up market, and we managed to outperform in an up market as well. So we're very proud of that. The dividend was um, introduced back in 2016. Uh, this was because the trust was trading at a discount, and the board introduced um, a dividend in order to widen the pool of investors that might want to invest in our trust. So now we have income investors and growth investors. Um, and sure enough, the discount narrowed 
uh, and we stopped doing buybacks. So that was a, a positive move in our view. It's not a natural um, dividend, i.e. we don't invest in companies that have income, bar one or two large cap companies, but it's not material. Um, uh, it comes out of capital and it's pegged to NAV. So it's 4% of NAV paid into installments over the year. And since it was introduced in 2016, we've had a nice upward trajectory of the payout of dividend. So finally, um, uh, IBT is exposed to a highly innovative sector that is biotech um, with the, all the characteristics of the tailwind of demand of healthcare and re relatively recession-proof um, biotech and healthcare industry. Uh, we're cognizant of the cycle of the biotech sector and that it does go in and out of favor. And we try and use a common sense approach on valuations. Um, performance, we've, we feel we've had solid performance in recent years. Um, and we obviously offer this 4% yield, uh, backed up by these KOLs that I mentioned um, in the industry and um, have a supportive board who will act and manage the discount and the premium as and when that's relevant. So that brings it to a close. So I thought I'll hand over to Billy for any Q&A. Thank you. And I'm sorry I cut out there my previous intro. Um, I, I, I guess you may not have heard, but if you do want to ask any questions, the bottom right hand corner, uh, if you type in your question, I'll uh, try and address them to the managers. Um, so just kicking off then, uh, are there, do you have any exposure to any of the companies that we've seen in the, in the press with sort of extremely costly drug treatment programs? Yes, so I'd say gene therapy um, seems to fit that criteria that you just said. They are probably the most expensive drugs out there. Why is that? The reason is because gene therapy and the way it works is to cure a disease rather than have a chronic treatment. So um, they price it such that if you imagine a, a patient costs $200,000 a year, I'm just picking numbers um, for blood transfusions if they're haemophiliac over their lifetime, if they were to have a gene therapy, the idea is that all those transfusions can be lessened, if not completely removed, the need for that. How much do you price this cure? And they, it's an upfront cost and it's a large amount. So although the ticket price seems very large, we have to take into account the whole economic benefit to society and the patient. How they pay for that is being addressed in various different permutations and ways, which is, do they pay upfront the whole ticket in one year, year one, or do they pay um, in incremental years over time for um, being well. So I'm well this year, I didn't have a transfusion, so I'll pay a portion of that ticket price. So the industry is trying to kind of tweak the different approaches to cater and help um, uh, help the world sort of pay for these curative um, treatments. So yes, we do have it with gene therapy within our portfolio, absolutely. Thank you. And then just in terms of the sort of, um, obviously it's a global, portfolio. Do you, do you have any sort of currency hedging to reduce any FX impact? Shall I take, I can take that. So, so what, what happens usually in, in, in the pharma industry, it's, since it's a global industry, when you develop drugs, you never very seldom at least think about the regional where, where it's going to sell. It, it's a global in, industry. So if you look at the, for example, the Gilead's, the Amgen, the largest companies, because this is kind of where they have the biggest exposure in terms of currency. You can see that 40% of sales usually globally comes from the US, around 20, 25 from Europe. Then you have five, 10% in Japan and the rest of the world. And when it comes to us, we, we tend so, for example, if we invest in an American company, uh, if, if the currency moves, you have kind of no, not natural stability, stabilizators that kick in. So if, if a dollar goes up 5%, you will never benefit the whole 5%. Maybe the share price goes up 2.5%. So this is how it, it works. Over time, it usually tends to even out because you also have the R&D centers that are based in different regions. Uh, so over time, it shouldn't be a big difference for us. Normally, only short-term in, interference, but over time, no. Maybe a long, long answer, but in general, it shouldn't have an effect on, on our thinking of how we invest. Thank you. And then two, two sort of related questions are, one is, will the industry remain US centric or will, will opportunities grow in Europe or Asia? Um, and, I, and I suppose also, are there any 
cheap UK biotechs that you you've owned, which obviously look even cheaper now that sterling is um, so cheap in terms of the M and A potential. So what, I guess the question is why is our portfolio US centric, and that is because yes, the industry is US centric. Why is that? Uh, if Kate was here, she'd say that's not the case on the venture side. So the smaller companies and ideas coming out of university is much more on par. Um, uh, and that's because there were good universities in Europe and America. But as the need for cash increases and the companies mature, um, unfortunately, the situation we are at the moment is that um, there's a lot more funding in the US. So companies can either list on NASDAQ and get probably a more supportive shareholder base, um, or they can stay UK and list and struggle to raise money. So a lot of companies that are successful in Europe just list on NASDAQ, um, and we've seen valuations rise just on the back of that. And GW would be an example, um, which is one of our portfolio companies that then got acquired by Jazz Pharmaceuticals. So it's it's a need for funding. Um, they're probably they're more the industry is more established over there. They've seen successful um, biotech companies turn into major biopharma companies like Amgen and Gilead. Um, so that's kind of become a compounding compounding effect. Um, uh, but no, the industry can't, you know, there are still ideas in Europe um, and certainly in Asia, and we watch it closely. And if we feel that there are opportunities, we can and will invest in them. The way we approach Asia, though, is we would rather invest in companies that are listed in the US so that you get the, the same regulations and um, reassurance as an investor uh, having um, the same the US regulations imposed. So that's how we get exposure to, to China. Um, and then your second question, do we look at UK? Yes, we look at UK um, uh, and we are valuation sensitive. If we like a company, we'll invest in them. Um, if often at the moment, especially if there's a very cheap biotech company, there's a reason why they're very cheap. And in terms of um, the US, um, are, is there a sort of milestone coming up in terms of any regulatory reviews um or is it just as simple as effectively who who's in power if it's republican then it's good and if it's democrat it's like to be all capped well the, actually the, the industry is located in democratic states uh it tends to be east coast west coast and most of the people who are employed in this industry are therefore in those states that doesn't really tally it's not whether it, it, one party is very industry friendly and the others isn't I think the Democrats recognized there was a real issue with drug pricing in America. They've, um, it's been a major uh, headwind for the sector for decades and constantly debated around presidential election time. Um, and so the, the Democrats have come up with this new um, bill, the Inflation Reduction Act that's passed, it's happening. And in the latter half of this decade, Medicare will be negotiating drug prices. So for L pay, um, drugs that are used in the elderly population will have price negotiations. Um, uh, and in a way, the positive of that is that it takes this issue off the table. Finally, they have something that's come through. Um, and what the, the, the way this bill will work is that those drugs that have been on the market for a while, they're making a huge amount of money um, and they've ticked certain boxes uh, will be negotiated, but the earlier stage companies of drugs that have just been newly launched on the market will be left alone. Um, so we think that where we're invested, which is in the earlier part of the, of the, of the drug cycle, it's relatively protected versus that. And it's more the larger companies that will feel the impact of the Inflation Reduction Act. What will that mean? That might mean more pressure to buy biotech companies because they've got to replenish the sales that they're losing. So it's, you know, it's a situation that's fluid, um, but we don't think it's particularly party political in that sense. Thank you. Good, good question just coming in actually. Um, could you give an example of a company in your portfolio that didn't go well and maybe explain why it went wrong and how you remedied the situation? Sorry, but I thought it was... <laughs> I'm sure not everything goes right. Shall, shall I start? Uh, I'll start. Yeah, yeah, and I'll have a think as well. <laughs> the, the 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 key is uh, to kind of cut your losses and and not kind of it's it's painful to lose money if if you have a company that performs badly you you need to reevaluate every day or every month when whenever when you when you have a company that goes down 
you need to look forward. Does the future look better than than it did yesterday? And sometimes we just sell and just take a loss and just cry a couple of days. But then we need to come back. And and the key is that you have more wins than than losses, or the wins you have are bigger than the losses you have. And if you're not willing to lose, I mean, we we take calculated risks. Maybe the wrong word, calculate. We we educated investments, uh, but knowing that this is a highly volatile and a relatively risky business, we have the notion that uh, many will fail eventually. And if you look at historically, a company or a project that comes in into phase one has a 95% probability of failure eventually. So with those odds, it's, it's not that easy, uh, but incrementally you can think about it between uh, investments and binary events, for example, when it comes to IBT, we are very unique in that sense that we tend to avoid taking binary bets, meaning that if you go into a very big event like a phase three readout or an approval, we tend to take down our positions because we don't want to take any binary, unnecessary binary risks. Uh, and that, this is how we operate, uh, at least. Thank you, Marek. And then, um... I guess the sector opportunity is there's obviously three types of company there or you spit out sort of profitable revenue growth and uh, unprofitable. Um, are, there, are there different valuation metrics that you look at um, and, and how do they look in terms of historical, the historical averages um, and, and, and are all three areas looking cheap by historical standards? I think, do you want me to kick off? So um, I think we had a slide and I didn't talk about this, but the various different pots that we invest in, if you divide it into three, early stage, revenue growth and profitable, we use different valuation metrics for. Um, so revenue growth would be peak type, uh, multiple on, on sales. Um, profitable companies, we look at PEs. And then early stage, you'll look at the enterprise value. Um, uh, and then look forward to what the potential is in terms of sales in the future. And so what we're seeing on the, on the early stage assets, they are looking relatively cheap um, versus history. You can take a look at market cap to cash, for example, and that looks quite extreme right now in terms of cheap and inverted commas. But like I said earlier, a lot of these companies IPO'd early or they're in trouble and their products haven't worked. So there's often a reason why they are cheap. And on top of that, they are burning cash. So that cash level is going to be reducing every month. Um, so you need to be cognizant of that, I think, when, when looking at the early stage companies. Price to peak sales, it depends what market they're in. If they're in a very hot area like oncology or CNS or orphan, um, the multiples are probably looking moderate right now, not screamingly cheap and not screamingly expensive. Um, and then on the profitable side, if you charted all the profitable biotech companies over the last 20 years, they will look really cheap in historic versus history. But why is that? That's because their top lines aren't growing as fast as they used to, and their bottom lines aren't growing as fast as they used to. So there are reasons behind these um, valuations. So it's very, we can't broad brush say the sector is cheap right now, and this is why. It, it's more nuanced than that. Billy, really, we can't hear you. You're on mute. Sorry, um, there are no more questions at the moment. Um, so, um, but we've pretty much got to the end of the time slot. Um, thank you, Elsa and Marek, uh, for a very interesting presentation. Thank you all for, for dialing in. Um, next week, we've got a whole week of lunchtime presentations on the subject of investing for income. On Monday, we'll be starting with an old friend of mine, Simon Elliott, who's latterly of the Money Makers podcast in Winter Floods, but now at JP Morgan, who will be discussing with my colleague David Kimberley how investment trusts can best be used for income investors. Uh, please do join us for that or others during the rest of the month. If you haven't signed up, uh, the details are on the Trust Intelligence website and the presentation uh, recording uh, will be available on our website um, soon when we can upload it. Uh, but thank you so much for joining and, and thank you once again, Elsa and Marek. Thank you, Billy, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Hey.